Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I really wanted to talk about accepting an autism diagnosis. How do you go about accepting that diagnosis and do you ever accept it fully? You know, these are questions and conversations that people don't want to have because a lot of people out there are like, oh, if you don't accept autism, you don't accept your child. And I think that's really unfair to say because this has nothing to do really with accepting your child. This is about your own personal journey. This is about trying to accept that they're going to have challenges in life. And if your child is not speaking and you can see they're clearly distressed, then that's upsetting as a parent. You fight for so long to get that diagnosis. And I remember the day I got his diagnosis, I spoke about it before, I just cried. I just, it hits you. And, and I knew, I knew what they were gonna say. But when they say, yes, you have an autism diagnosis, it's like your brain goes from zero to a hundred and the what ifs and, you know, are, are they gonna have a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Or are they gonna be happy? Are they gonna live independently? How are they gonna live without me? You know, like that is a massive fear. It's like, my child is vulnerable. And yes, they're not sick and, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that Dylan is healthy, but it's still a massive worry. I know for me personally, after I had the first few days of just crying and being upset of, you know, really kind of mourning what I thought Dylan's life was going to be like, I had this dream of what my child was going to be like and the life they were going to live. And it's okay to say that. It's okay to say, this sucks. I didn't want this. Nobody wants their child to struggle. It's okay to admit that. And it's okay to say, I'm scared. Because I was scared for a very long time. You know, when Dylan was diagnosed, Andrew was like, no, come on, he's fine. He's gonna be fine. And I was like, I can't believe you don't feel like I do. But he was trying to be strong for me and everything's gonna be fine. And I was like, but, how do you know everything is going to be fine? He's non-verbal. They've just told us he might never, he's going to struggle socially his whole life. He might never talk. All these things, it's the, the unknown. And I know everyone's life and every child's life is the unknown, but it's just being told, hey, your child's life is probably going to be a little bit more difficult and harder than most, and especially if they are non-verbal. The whole part of living and, and communicating and being in society, and you have to communicate to live independently. This is hard and I'm worried for my child and I want everything to be okay. And right now my brain is not okay. And that's the first step of accepting an autism diagnosis is to accept and recognize your own feelings and saying it's okay to have these feelings. And don't let anyone shame you into thinking, oh, you don't want the best for your child. You're not thinking positively because we can't think positively all the time. Everyone accepts a diagnosis at a different time. So Andrew's came later. And that obviously caused a bit of a divide between myself and Andrew because I felt he didn't understand me, but he was just processing it in his own different way. It, there's no right or wrong way of processing things. You know, my family were great, but they were like, oh, he's gonna be fine, he's gonna be fine. And again, well-meaning, they, they, they meant well, but for me, it made me feel more isolated. Sometimes you just want someone to say, I get that. And I think that's why other parents of neurodivergent children they, we get each other. It's like, I get where you're coming from. I understand where you are watching me right now. We get each other. I don't have to have to say anything more and you you understand me. Of course I am gonna say more because it would be a pretty bad video if I didn't say any more, but you get me and I get you. For me, helping accepting was taking one step at a time and I became fierce mama bear. I was like, right, I need to do this, I need to do that. How can I help them? And that kept me focused. It was about putting one foot in front of the other not looking too far in the future, but also looking far in the future because I had to give him the tools that he needed to be able to live a life. And we all want our children to live independently. And the more I could see improvement in him, the more I could see there was things you could do, the better. But it's exhausting. It is absolutely exhausting. And it's like, and again, it's accepting that it's exhausting and, and going like, right, okay, I've got to do this, I've got to keep fighting and you have to fight for an EHCP plan, you have to fight for schools and you've got to fight for this and what is the right school and what and how do I help them make friends and how do I help them build a community around them? And I think, again, up until recently, my, my biggest fear was how 
how would Dylan live without me? Oh my gosh, you see, it's still like 13 years, it's still, it does worry me, you know? And I'm giving Dylan the tools he needs now to be able to live an, an independent life. But what does worry me is how would he live without me? And that's not to be like, I'm this whole world and I'm everything, but you know, the primary caregiver, a father or a mother or a grandmother, you know, I'm talking from my point of view now, but you know, I, I gave birth to Dylan and, you know, I guess I knew him before anyone else did. And uh, when he couldn't speak, I could understand him. And I knew what he wanted. And even now, when he can't verbalize how he feels, when he's anxious or he's hiding under the table at school or he's with his daddy and he messages me, I know what he needs. And I'm thinking, oh my God, if, if I'm not here, how does he do this life? How does he do life without me? And so what I'm trying to do at the moment, let me pull myself together. Um, what I'm trying to do at the moment is give him the tools to live an independent life. And that helps me accept it. For Dylan, it was about helping him create a world around him. How do I create Dylan's army around him? And that's obviously his siblings for us were very important. It depends on your own family dynamic. It could be cousins, it could be aunties, uncles. You know, we live um, away from my family down here. Um, so it is just kind of us, you know, but even having, you know, his aunties and uncles who understand him and we, we try and meet up for family gatherings quite a lot. And, you know, he's becoming more comfortable with them. And, and even, you know, when my mom and uh, Laura Jane came over from New Zealand last summer, he hadn't seen them in a year and a half. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry if I don't look you in the eye, but it makes me feel uncomfortable. And I was so proud that I had given him the tools to be able to communicate that. Like how amazing if we could all speak our truth like that. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't want to talk to you today because I just don't feel like talking to anybody. I mean, I would love to do that and that is that is a great part about being neurodivergent as well like it takes away a bit of that filter and that you know the social cues we've all been taught to do um you know smile and be happy and be polite well sometimes you just don't want to be polite and that's fine but um for us for Dylan it is about creating an army around him it's about creating other people he can go to other than me and this helps a little bit um, with my worries and uh, and as I said before I used to be really frightened about this but how I kind of counteracted or counterbalanced I think the word is um, that is to make sure that he had you know good interactions with his aunties or his uncles and his cousins um, and, and doing games they could play together and building bonds with his brother and sister is, is a huge thing as well you know Andrew and I used to do like teams like you know mummy and daddy against Dylan and Luca and Naya and you know kind of nerf gun wars or you know and Luca and Dylan are the best of friends now they still fight like brothers but I kind of like that as well so all of this accepting autism, this is me and my journey and, you know, um, and Andrew's journey. I can't reiterate enough. It's not about accepting Dylan. It's about accepting the diagnosis. Sometimes I think I've accepted it and I think I'm totally fine with it. And then other times when I see him struggle, I'm like, oh, I hate this for you. I hate this that you have this feeling and I hate that you get anxious and I hate that you're scared. And, and especially now that Dylan's verbal, he says to me, mommy, make it go away fix this, make this go away. And if I don't know how to fix it, it is just, it's the worst feeling in the world because we as parents, it's like, no, my job is to help you. My job is to fix things, you know? And if I can't fix it, I'll goddamn find out how I do fix it. And that has been my mission is everything, any problem he comes across, I will find a way, I'll find a solution. Autism is quite a new thing still. You know, we, we talk about, you know, the diagnosis is back when Dylan was, you know, two. It still wasn't very much known about it. And to be honest, even now, we still don't know much about other neurological conditions. We don't know much about the brain. I do know that a lot of the autism side of things, it comes down to a sensory thing. So I've been learning more about helping him in a sensory way and also how to deal with the feelings that come up, recognizing the feelings, We've done that since he's been a little boy and he couldn't communicate with us. He would use the pecs to show, and I know I always say it, but you know, when he was younger, I would feel like a children's entertainer. You know, I'd be like, you're happy, you're sad. <laughs> I would do this all the time to try and help him recognize these feelings that he had. Um, I got some very strange looks at times, but hey, you, 
that kind that comes with the uh, that comes with the diagnosis as well, you know. And again, it's that is also hard. It's also hard looking at judgment from others and also comparing. We all compare ourselves to other people. We all compare our children to other children. It's human nature. Again, it's it's not me saying anything that's not true. We all you know, kind of want to do better I and mean, we kind of see how oh, they're doing well and you know, I want to do that too. And it's inspiring as well. It's not always a bad thing, but we do. And you're seeing my friends' children, you know, they go on ski holidays and they do this stuff together as a family. It's accepting that your family dynamic is going to look different. You know, we go to a restaurant, we're there for 10 minutes. You know, I'm pretty much pre-ordering as I'm getting there just to give Luca and Naya. And for us, um, sense of normality I guess as well um you know going out for birthdays or quite often not we don't go and we stay home and you know you can feel a bit isolated sometimes because being in your own home is safer than going out but therefore you also need to push your child in certain situations as well because they might enjoy it but again these are all the things that go through our heads how do we give them you know how do we push them when do we not know to push them enough and I mean, I'm still learning that myself now as Dylan enters teenagehood. You know, he wants to, as any teenager does, kind of want to be in his room gaming. And I'm still trying to get him out because I don't want him to become too into his, in his, you know, own little gaming world. So I pop in there. I'm on Roblox. I, I don't even like gaming. I'm sorry, Dylan, if you're watching this, but I don't. <laughs> I do it. I do it so I can connect with him. You know, but these are all things that are hard. And most of the time, I've accepted it. Most of the time I've accepted that my family looks different. We tend to try and do things that Dylan likes, like water parks and water slides. And you know, it does it does bring you back a bit to your childhood as well. And Andrew and I will be really silly and stupid with him and the children and run around. And those little moments that we have together, it's like, oh my God, look, we're, look at him, look at what he's doing. And they are the most amazing moments. And then there's other times you have to accept that you might never do those things that your friends are doing and we might never go on a you know family adventure where we all go skiing down a mountain together and you know not that i'm a very good skier anyway but you know we can all have hopes and dreams right <laughs> um yeah so it is about trying to i guess not look at the rule book not look at what a family should look like and accepting that your family's not going to look like that and really celebrating the moments that we have that are amazing and you know when Dylan joins on in on Christmas day it's incredible and yes it's the fastest Christmas day morning ever when he's opening the presents and there's paper going everywhere and he's like oh thanks thanks mom and dad thanks Santa bye and he's gone and you're like okay Dylan love you and it's about accepting that he's happy in his room and he's happy playing with his toys on his own and it's accepting for me that again we're never gonna do Christmas cards in matching jumpers all together because Dylan doesn't really like photographs, but he is starting to let me take photographs as he's starting to see the importance of them. And he's like, oh, well, it'd be good to show my kids one day what I look like as a child. And, you know, he's really enjoying seeing the similarities um, between um, myself and him and his dad and him. And, you know, he looks quite like me, I think. And he really enjoys seeing the photographs of, oh, mommy, I can see that I look like you here. And I'm like, yes, I know. And aren't I lucky that my parents took photos of me so I can take photos of you so we can show your children. So it's about, you know, kind of doing all that kind of stuff with him. But yeah, I'm probably going off on a tangent here, but this, this subject I could just go on about for hours. But I think, you know, the moral of the story is it takes a while to accept the whole autism diagnosis. And you might never fully accept it and that does not mean again that you don't accept your child because you do and it really hit me on Dylan's 13th birthday I was like I'm not actually scared for his future anymore he's gonna be okay he's gonna be okay and it's taken years of work on helping him helping myself figuring out our family dynamic, helping Luca come to terms with it, helping Naya come to terms with it. And that comes with time. You're not gonna wake up one day and be like, oh, this is amazing, I've totally got this. No, some days you might be like, I've got this whole thing down. And some days you might be like, this sucks. And recognizing those feelings, having a cry, 
is perfectly natural and I want you to do that. And then I want you to stand back up again and again, remind yourself that your child's not sick. It's just we're to work this out and we're gonna write our own book. And this is how we tell Luca and Naya about it as well. Because I know Luca has mentioned a few times, or oh, how come you know we don't get to do this like my friends? And that's hard. And I'm like, I know, I know this is hard, honey, but Dylan finds it hard to do these things. And the other thing we're getting quite a lot of at the moment is how come Dylan can st spend time on his computer, but I can't? And I'm like, well, because I actually feel sorry for Dylan that he wants to stay in his room the whole time on his computer games. And I'm trying to give you a childhood. I want you to experience these things. And he's getting his head around it slowly. Um, and I'm like, you know, we have to help Dylan. We have to help him, you know, bring him out more. And I said to Luca, when he's older, try and in include him in things because Dylan wants to be included. He just doesn't know how. And so again, it's about helping Luca and Naya understand him. And they do for the most part. Um, and that helps ease my anxieties. The sensory side of things, there are things we can do. And I love it when I know what to do. And I, I, I love helping uh, parents and carers and families on how to help their, their, that child because that excites me because I know what to do with that. What I don't love is when Dylan struggles and I wish I could just take that away from him. But again, it's all part of this journey that we're on and we are in it together. And that brings me comfort knowing that I'm not alone in these thoughts, which is why I like to have these conversations and to talk to you guys about it and to hear your thoughts. It's really important. So let's keep the conversation going. Um, please do subscribe to my channel if you like hearing from us and we are doing more videos. I'm trying to be consistent with every week, but as you know, life sometimes gets in the way with three kids and a dog and everything else. You can see over there listening to me. The more we talk about this, the more we help each other and make the world a better place for our babies. Anyway, I hope you have a lovely day wherever you are in the world. And thanks again for joining me and listening to me. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Okay. Should we make a puppy? <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs>